was uh, enormous. You couldn't tell that you had an Airbus A310 aircraft there. I mean, you couldn't even tell you had two engines. TWA Flight 800 is airborne. Talk to me. What do you have for us? Without warning, a powerful explosion tears the fuselage apart. Debris from TWA Flight 800 litters the water nearly 75 miles east of Manhattan. Investigators begin the painstaking task of piecing together what happened to TWA 800. The NTSB's lead investigator, Al Dickinson, faces an urgent task. It was extremely important for us to find out what happened because there were so many 747s flying at that time. The NTSB will lead the investigation. This is a half mile block here. While the FBI launches a parallel criminal inquiry. You know, that people think this is exclusive uh, jurisdiction of the NTSB. That's not correct. If it's a criminal matter, we have to get out there right away. The FBI believes they may already have an explanation for the disaster over Long Island. Three years earlier, in 1993, terrorists drove a bomb into the World Trade Center. Just over a year before, Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma. Now, the mid-air explosion of TWA 800 is also being linked to terrorism. It was all over the news how people thought they saw something going up to hit an aircraft. A lot of them thought they saw missiles. NTSB investigators spend weeks carefully searching for any sign of foul play. They study wreckage from almost every part of the 230-foot-long plane. Pretty much during the whole time we were there, we were looking for something that would support any kind of missile or bomb. They find no signs of an explosive device. No pitting. No cratering, nothing. We didn't find the uh, soot patterns in a radiating pattern that might have been from a bomb. We didn't find this micro cratering where a hot piece of metal are, are impacting other pieces of metal. It wasn't a bomb. No piece had any evidence of a bomb at all. NTSB investigators believe it was an exploding fuel tank that took down TWA 800, but they still don't know what sparked the blast. We need to prove three things. The fuel was flammable. The explosion has to be powerful enough to rupture the tank. And finally, something created a spark to ignite the fuel. Let's start with the first one, flammability. Jet fuel in its liquid form is not flammable, but when heated, the fuel starts to vaporize. When combined with oxygen already present in the tank, this vapor can become highly flammable. At the altitude where TWA 800 exploded, almost 14,000 feet, jet fuel needs to reach 96 degrees Fahrenheit before it can ignite. There's just one problem. The manufacturer said, well, it never gets that hot in there. According to Boeing, the fuel tanks housed inside the wings would never get hot enough for the fuel to vaporize. On the day of the fatal flight, the temperature at JFK Airport hit 87 degrees Fahrenheit, well below the flash point for jet fuel. The NTSB's theory may be wrong. Investigators examine the design schematics of the aircraft. An intriguing detail catches their attention. 
I remember learning that the placement of the air conditioning units were underneath the center tank, and those generate a fair amount of heat. They cool the aircraft, but the packs themselves get quite hot during that procedure. On TWA 800, the air conditioning units were working extra hard to keep the cabin cool on a hot evening. The air conditioning packs underneath the center ring fuel tank had been operating for, I believe, several hours prior to takeoff. Could heat from the units have boosted the temperature inside the tanks to a dangerously high level? There's only one way to find out. The only way we were going to determine the actual conditions inside the fuel tank was by performing a flight test. They decide to reproduce the exact conditions of the accident flight. All right, let's start it up. The same type of plane, the same fuel load, and most importantly, exactly the same air conditioning units. It's a risky undertaking filled with uncertainties. The test flight reaches the same altitude as TWA 800. Holy crow. The temperature readings are terrifying. These air conditioner packs were getting up to 350 degrees. 350 degrees is about what you turn your oven to to bake a chicken. This is off the charts. The temperature in the tank hits 127 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees above the flash point. OK, let's get back down to the ground. Investigators are now certain that the fuel in the tanks of TWA 800 did become flammable. Investigators know the Northwest Airlink Flight 5719 pilots could not have heard a low altitude warning. But they still don't understand why the plane was descending so rapidly. They wonder if weather conditions may have played a role. They check the temperatures and the type of precipitation encountered by the turboprop. These are prime conditions for icing. The plane would have descended right through it. Investigators need to know how bad the icing conditions were just before the crash. I'm just wondering if you have a couple of minutes. They talked to other pilots who flew into Hibbing that night. So you were aware of the potential for icing during your approach into Hibbing? The pilots tell Valisi they faced moderate icing conditions. But why would these two pilots start their descent so late? They also describe a common technique used to prevent ice accumulation. It now seems the rapid descent was not due to a loss of control caused by icing. Instead, it looks like it was part of a deliberate strategy to avoid icing. Finally, investigators get the evidence they've been waiting for, the cockpit voice recording. All right, everybody ready? Play the tape. The investigators listen carefully to the recording. It's what is not said that alarms them the most. Why isn't the first officer making his altitude call outs? First Officer Erickson should be telling his captain how close they are to their minimum altitude and warning him when they descend past it. But he does neither. You're down? Flaps 20. He never told the captain how close they were getting to the ground. Captain Fallitz has his hands full landing the plane. He expects his first officer to keep an eye on their altitude. But on this flight, the first officer never once reports the altitude as the plane speeds closer and closer to the ground. The CDR leads investigators to wonder, was the loss of 18 lives in the Hibbing crash due to the failings of an inexperienced young pilot. 
Captain Fallitz was known as a skilled senior pilot. But a deeper look reveals a man with a troubling record. When we looked at the captain's training records, we began to understand that he had some previous issues in his flight training. Boom, boom, boom. Soon after he joined the company, he failed his oral exam. He failed two more proficiency exams in his career. That's unusual for a professional pilot to fail that many times. The problems hadn't been tracked by anybody in the organization because they had failed at different locations. So nobody put everything together until we did. Some of the instructor pilots were noting that his cockpit resource management wasn't up to par and that he had a tendency to be domineering in the cockpit. Well, he had an issue with dealing with other people. Are all these formal complaints against Captain Fallots? Marvin was the first captain I flew with after my IOE, my initial operating experience. And he tended to be a little bit domineering and would berate you and was intolerant of mistakes and really not a particularly great instructor pilot. Mm. Wow. Perhaps the most disturbing complaint against Captain Fallot is that he once physically struck a colleague in anger. For a professional pilot, to physically have an altercation or attempt to, quote, discipline a fellow employee is totally unacceptable. I don't get it. What was making this guy so angry? You gotta be freaking kidding me. According to people who knew him, Captain Fallitz's morale took a big hit when Northwest Airlink instituted a new residence policy for their pilots. About a year before, the company, for cost-saving purposes, started a new policy where they required the pilots to reside at their outstations. These would be small towns outside of Minneapolis. Investigators make another disturbing discovery. Captain Fallots would sometimes be deliberately rough with the flight controls. His way of getting revenge in the company was to sometimes take it out of the passengers. I was amazed when I read that, to tell you the truth. And I was amazed that a person would intentionally make a rough flight to make people mad because what good does that do? This guy, from what I understand, he did it because he wanted to punish the airline. As more and more details about the captain's personality emerge, investigators are forced to consider a troubling question. Could his anger somehow have caused this crash? The morning after the crash, a blackened scar on a frozen field marks the fatal impact zone of Flight 3272. A team from the National Transportation Safety Board is already at work recovering pieces of wreckage for analysis. Investigators head to Detroit Metropolitan Airport. They want to hear from the last person to speak with the pilots, the approach controller. It was coming on rush hour. We had winter weather. From air traffic control, we learned that it, the weather was bad and airplanes were starting to pile up on their approach into Detroit. I made sure there was plenty of distance between them. There were other airplanes on approach to Detroit, so sometimes when they're in close proximity, there can be an issue with wake vortex coming off one airplane that may affect another. A wake vortex is a horizontal tornado that trails behind an aircraft. If one plane flies too close to the wake of another, it can encounter sudden and extreme turbulence. So, there's the Airbus. American West Airlines Flight 50. The Airbus is almost twice the size of the Embraer 120. A wake vortex incident seems possible. Oh, God. But investigators won't know for certain until experts at NASA analyze the radar data. And that settles that. But it's another dead end. 
was an awake vortex. The analysis reveals that the wake from American Airlines Flight 50 could not have dropped to the altitude of Com Air 3272. Investigators are back where they started. Why 29 people died just minutes before landing is still a mystery. NTSB system specialist John DeLisi faces one of the biggest challenges of his career. We knew the airplane was on approach into Detroit and something dramatic happened. Something went wrong suddenly. What a mess. The NTSB's Richard Rodriguez leads the investigation. Our mission is to find the cause of an accident, make recommendations that will prevent it from ever happening again. He's very familiar with this type of plane, having investigated previous accidents involving the Embraer 120. The Embraer 120 propeller blade had separated due to a fatigue crack uh, over in an accident earlier in Georgia, and the crew was able to land it, but uh, it was very difficult to control. In two previous cases, part of a propeller blade broke off in mid-flight. Could it have happened again? Rodriguez reviews details of where the two propellers were found at the Detroit crash site. He makes a troubling discovery. Part of one blade ended up 75 feet away from the main impact crater. He can't help but wonder, is this the third time he's seen an Embraer 120 propeller fail? We need to take a look at those propeller blades. We wanted to get those blades of the propeller to ensure they were intact at impact. Rodriguez studies the blade fragment, looking for evidence of failure. If the propeller blades were all attached and spinning at impact, they would have all hit the ground with tremendous force, resulting in distinctive damage on every blade. This is impact damage. We're spinning right to the end. The analysis leaves no doubt. Though the propellers fragmented when they hit the ground, they did not fail in flight. Air China Flight 129 has been in the air for a little less than two hours. Among the 155 passengers is a group of Korean tourists flying home from vacation. Their tour guide is 28-year-old Seoul Iksu. I had just started a new job, and my wife was four months pregnant. There were about 20 people traveling with our agency. I had many things to take care of. I just can't believe that happened. I was working very hard because I had ambitions to be promoted. I didn't take breaks and work late. I was trying my best. But for Seoul like Su, who's trying to make a good impression in his new job, today is feeling like a disaster. I mean, what kind of person does that? It all started to go wrong this morning when he made a mistake that he worries could get him fired. I had arranged for the group to sit in first class, but right before we got to the airport, I realized that I'd left my passport and bag in the hotel lobby. The bus driver had to turn around and go back to the hotel. The good seats were first come, first served. Because we had to return to the hotel, my group was pushed to seats at the very back of the plane. Seoul Iksu has no way of knowing the far more important impact of this minor mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin our approach to Kimei Airport. Local weather is foggy with some rain. We'll be landing in approximately 20 minutes. Changing weather conditions are posing a challenge for the crew. Clear to land runway 18. Reduce speed. Okay. 
Seoul Lake Sioux worries that the bad weather will delay their arrival in Busan. I heard people screaming. I was sliding. I couldn't keep my body straight because the speed was too fast. Then, Air China Flight 129 has crashed into the side of Mount Dot Day, miles from the intended runway. Of the 166 people on board, 37 survive. Almost all those who made it out alive were seated near tour guide Sol Iksu. 90% of the tour group I was traveling with survived. The fact that the young tour guide forgot his passport something he thought was a shameful mistake, will be remembered forever as a life-saving stroke of luck. Air China Flight 129 has crashed into the side of Mount Dot Day, miles from the intended runway. After any plane crash near a runway, some of the first people investigators want to speak to are the air traffic controllers. They were slated to perform a straight-in approach but there was change to a circling approach. Why the sudden change? The wind changed direction. I changed the, the approach so we can land into the wind. Switching from straight in to a circling approach is something that happens routinely at airports around the world. Some airports, you have to come one way in because of mountains or whatever, and then once you get to the airport, because of winds, you may circle and land. Flight 129 was originally scheduled to land on runway 36 left, coming in from the south. But after the change, they were headed for runway 18 right, coming in from the north instead. We're closer to sea. The weather is always changing. We do this all the time. Air traffic control gave them clearance for a circling approach, which was appropriate for the weather conditions at the time. Is there anything else you can remember? Communications. The radio communications were all wrong. How do you mean? Air China 129, contact tower 118.1, circle west. Shortly after he instructs flight 129 to do a circling approach, the tower controller tells the pilots to switch to a new radio frequency. Air China 129, contact tower 118.1. All airports use a standard frequency to communicate in emergency situations. If air traffic control even suspects a plane is in distress, they will use this frequency to contact the crew. Give me a tower, Air China 129, circular approach, 18 right. Air China 129, check wheels down. Wind 210 at 17 knots. Clear to land runway 18 right. They finally call me back. It seemed like we were finally back on track. Then less than a minute later, they crashed into the mountain. The Air China crew was slow to respond to air traffic control. Investigators need to know what was going on in the cockpit during the unusual delay. If air traffic controllers make a statement and the crew either doesn't answer or misinterprets it, it can cause the accident. Garuda Indonesia Flight 152, who left the Indonesian capital of Jakarta nearly 90 minutes ago. Headed northwest, it's expected to arrive at its destination in about half an hour. Surface winds, calm, visibility 400 meters. Present weather, smoke. Forest fires in Sumatra have sent a thick blanket of smoke across all of Southeast Asia. 
Indonesia 152, turn right heading 046. Turn right heading 046, Indonesia 152. Any second now, the controller expects to see Flight 152 turn onto final approach. What? The Airbus has somehow become dangerously close to the ground. Come on! Climb! 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 Investigators gather information from the air traffic controller, the last person to have communicated with Flight 152. They approached from the southeast. I was trying to bring them in this way. A left turn, then a right turn that gets them into runway 05. The controller suspects the captain somehow misinterpreted his instructions and missed the final turn. With no sign of the black boxes, investigators gather air traffic recordings made in the tower. It's hoped they can shed some light on why the plane turned away from the airport instead of towards it. Roll tape. Confirming descent to flight level 140. The air traffic recordings capture only the radio calls between the pilots and the controller. Indonesia 152, descend to 3,000 feet for runway 05. They're not as helpful as a CVR recording, which would reveal all sounds and conversation inside the cockpit. Reduce speed 220. But investigators listen closely for any clue as to why the A300 veered so badly off course. On heading 215, Indonesia 152. That puts them about here, right on course. One more right turn, and he's lined up with the runway. Indonesia 152, turn right heading 046. There it is, clear as day. Turn right heading 046, Indonesia 152. Okay, stop there. They definitely understood, turn right. How the flight went so horribly wrong in the final few moments is baffling. It's in the exact opposite direction they were told. Investigators need the CVR if they hope to figure out what exactly went on in the cockpit of Flight 152. The crash of U.S. Air Flight 1016 is the first accident involving a major airline in North Carolina in 20 years. Both pilots and the cabin crew have survived, but of the 52 passengers, 37 are dead. Greg Fyth, senior investigator with the National Transportation Safety Board, will lead the investigation. Anytime you go to an airplane accident site, a crash site, there's always this wave of emotion. I don't care how seasoned an investigator you are, because you know that people have been seriously injured or killed in that particular event. Examining the wreckage is the team's first task. So what do we got? They must determine if a loss of engine power was a factor in the crash. Uh -huh. They examine the DC-9's two Pratt & Whitney power plants. Right away, they spot something unexpected. Look at that. The thrust reverser on this engine is deployed. Their examination of the right engine indicated that the, uh, the thrust reverser was in the deployed position and that the thrust reverser on the left engine was in the stowed position. Thrust reversers are deployed upon landing to help slow the plane down. They work by redirecting the engine's high-powered exhaust gases forward. If it happens in flight, that's detrimental because if it happens on one engine, in a multi-engine airplane, you create an asymmetrical thrust situation. Maybe that's what brought this flight down. We've had thrust reversers deploy in flight. 
And depending on the speed of the aircraft, you can literally break that engine right off the aircraft. Closer investigation reveals abrasion marks on the metal of the right side reverser. Marks that suggest a heavy impact with the ground. It's an important clue. Further analysis leads to a definitive answer. Investigators know exactly when and how the right side reverser opened. They were able to make a determination that the reverser on that right engine, even though it was deployed, um, happened during the course of the impact sequence and did not happen in flight. At least we know it wasn't thrust reversers. Eliminating one potential cause is a step forward for investigators. But they're still a long way from understanding what brought down U.S. Air Flight 1016. Investigators need to understand why air traffic control in Charlotte didn't warn U.S. Air Flight 1016 about a fierce storm over the airport. Oh, hey. Yeah. Good to meet you. The air traffic controllers had more information and they could see and they had been watching this thunderstorm for much longer than the flight crew had. So we knew very early on was going to be one of the central areas of focus to understand it. Why did you tell the pilots the weather was good enough to land in? The weather reports told us it was. The controller reveals that he relied on a bulletin from the National Weather Service. It showed that conditions were well within limits for a safe landing. I even asked a pilot who landed four minutes earlier how it was. U.S. Air 983, how was the ride in your final approach? Smooth, U.S. Air 983. U.S. Air 1016, previous flight just exited the runway. He said it was a smooth ride. It was fine, no problems. The weather bulletin issued at 6.36 p.m. was indeed correct. Conditions were clear to land. But minutes later, the skies over the airport opened up and heavy rain poured down. By the time I got to the next bulletin, it was too late. Listen, I really appreciate your help. If I have more questions, is it all right if I call you? All right? Sure. Thanks. It's now clear to investigators that weather conditions at the Charlotte airport changed very quickly. What's unclear is why the controller's weather report failed to forecast the change. Let's see what we have here. They studied the reports that the National Weather Service issued for Charlotte Airport that day. 6.36 p.m. Light rain showers. 6.40 p.m. Heavy rain showers. It seems the Weather Service correctly identified the change in conditions. But then, investigators make an important discovery. It took two minutes for the Weather Service to transmit the new information in an updated bulletin. The problem came from the air traffic controllers not having a, a full body of information from the National Weather Service. Flaps 40, please. So they weren't providing real-time information to the flight crew. Weather radar images soon lead to another discovery. This is crazy. Look at that. There are two storm cells moving in here. As the U.S. air pilots were trying to avoid one storm formation... 1840... Another storm cell... 1842... ...suddenly increased in intensity. They were blindsided. Here come the wipers. The late weather report left the crew unprepared for the sudden downpour. The critical question now, was the rainstorm strong enough to knock Flight 1016 out of the sky? Salvage crews pull what remains of Transasia Flight 235 from the Keelong River. There's no telling which piece of wreckage might hold an important clue. Investigators wonder if the flight control system shows any sign of a malfunction. Nothing wrong with this actuator. We cannot find anything wrong with the actuator, the linkage of the control. 
control system seems fine. A search for any pre-impact failures in the plane's hydraulic system also comes up empty. Nothing wrong with the hydraulics. Is this the left engine? Uh, yes. Investigators know from the dash cam video that the plane was banked steeply to the left. A mechanical fault with the left engine seems like the next most obvious suspect. We need to take a look inside. Get the bore scope. Why would you not sit and count out these parts? From a borescope examination, we can see whether or not the compressor and turbine are damaged on the inside. Since the turbine rotates with extremely high speed, if it is even slightly damaged, it will be completely destroyed. But the borescope examination yields no new clues. Left engine completely operational. Ah, strange. They need to explore other possibilities. What about the right engine? Let's go take a look. They study the right engine. And what they find is mystifying. Look at the blades. They're feathered. Feathered is a propeller's fail-safe position. When a propeller engine loses power in flight, the blades automatically rotate parallel to the airstream to reduce drag. The discovery only deepens the mystery. Why would the right engine be feathered when the dash cam video clearly shows the plane banking to the left? It doesn't make any sense. Let's have a look. When we discover a, a feather of the propeller, we know there should be something wrong about the engine. Anything? Nothing at all. Both engines yielded normal results after examination. They were both fine. There's nothing wrong with this engine either. If both engines were operational, or well, why did this plane crash? It's just before 6 a.m. at Sharm El Sheikh Airport in Egypt. 217 passengers are headed to St. Petersburg, Russia, some four hours away. At 5.51 a.m., Metrojet Flight 9268 lifts into the air. The aircraft took off in a standard way. No problems with the takeoff. Flight 9268 reaches cruising altitude, 31,000 feet above the Sinai Peninsula. All is going smoothly at air traffic control until 6.13 a.m. when Flight 9268 does something unexpected. The Airbus seems to be dropping. Metrojet 9268, are you experiencing any difficulties? And all of a sudden, everything just dropped off at the altitude, just dropped and disappeared. Do you read me? As rescuers arrive on the scene, it soon becomes clear that there are no survivors. Airbus aircraft just simply do not fall out of the sky. So that gets everyone's ears perked up on what happened here. Really? There are rumors this was a terrorist attack. You're right there. Take a look at this. A terrorist group affiliated with Islamic State fighting to seize territory across the Middle East claims responsibility for bringing down Metrojet 9268. 
They say it was in retaliation for Russian military attacks in Syria. Though there is no proof to back up the claim, there's speculation that attackers used a surface-to-air missile. When I looked at the debris field, I kept thinking right again. Another catastrophic, shocking crash as a result of an ignition device hitting the aircraft. After the fall of Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, militants raided his weapons depots, flooding the region with Russian-made shoulder-mounted missile launchers. Investigators need to know if those weapons are powerful enough to hit an airliner at cruising altitude. These are the missiles they're using. The plane was flying at 31,000 feet. What's the range on those missiles? I was just looking at the specs. Check it out. They study military documents and make some quick calculations. They soon have their answer. It's not possible. Not with the weapons they have. It was too high of an altitude to be a surface-to-air missile. There was good reason for people to speculate initially that this could have been a surface-to-air missile. That group has used a surface-to-air missile before, specifically in early 2014, to shoot down successfully an Egyptian helicopter. The first officer's wife is being interviewed. На тот момент еще никто не был, никто не понимал, точно ли это или нет. Все еще как бы были в ожидании. What she's saying, I can't understand a word. They spoke with the father just before he flew out of Shalmo Sheikh. And what did he say? He said there were mechanical issues with the plane. I did see reports of family members quoting that the safety was dubious on this aircraft. There's only one way to find out. The fact that the aircraft might have had a lot of problems, you'd have to firstly find out what those problems were, and secondly, are they relevant to what we know has happened? Excuse me. Investigators speak with questions. the aircraft engineer who last serviced the airplane at Sharm El Sheikh Airport. What can you tell us about Metrojet 9268? We service it for 30 minutes before takeoff. Doesn't sound like a long time. That is a, a quick turnaround, and low-cost carriers sometimes have to do that. They work their people hard to turn the aircraft around fast so that that aircraft is in the air as, as many hours of the day as it possibly can be, earning money for them. The aircraft was 18 years old. It had been through several different owners. But maintenance engineers insist that the plane was mechanically sound. Significant incidents, maybe in the past, something like that. It had a tail strike in 2001. A tail strike is when the rear fuselage of a plane hits the runway during takeoff or landing. Damage can be minor or severe depending on the force of the impact. Maintenance records show that the tail strike damage was repaired. Investigators now wonder if a tail strike repair from 14 years ago may have fatally weakened the Metrojet Airbus. The shattered remains of Metrojet 9268 have been moved from the Sinai Desert to a massive warehouse in Cairo. Let me take a look at this. Investigators hope the collected debris can tell them if an improper tail strike repair from years ago doomed Metrojet Flight 9268. They sort through tail pieces from the Metrojet Airbus. They focus on the ones that were repaired Careful. because of the tail strike incident. If any mistakes or shortcuts are made during the repair, yeah. then that tends to put 
abnormal or uneven stresses on various parts of the metal structure, and that starts the process of metal fatigue, and you get cracks. Fatigue has certainly, to trained investigator, has quite distinctive characteristics. No signs of damage around the repair. Something else caused it. Before long, they also rule out engine failure and all other mechanical failures. It seems there was nothing wrong with the aircraft. It just doesn't make sense. It's been almost 48 hours since Thai Airways Flight 311 disappeared in the Himalayas. Investigators have yet to find the aircraft. But now, they're about to get an important break. Local villagers report that they found aircraft debris north of Kathmandu. The reported crash site is nowhere near the area they've been searching. I don't think they ever in their wildest imagination thought the airplane was north of the airport. North of Kathmandu, near the border with Tibet, the Himalayan peaks soar to an altitude of 20,000 feet. These northern summits are the reason almost all planes approach Tribhuvan Airport from the south, where the mountains are closer to 8,000 feet. Later that day, 27 miles north of Kathmandu, search crews find the remains of Thai Airways Flight 311. The point of impact is a steep rock face more than 11,000 feet up the side of a remote mountain. None of the 113 people on board have survived. The challenge for investigators is unlike anything they've encountered before. The terrain is so extreme, helicopters can't land near the impact zone. The team will have to trek more than 3,000 feet up from the base camp to reach the wreckage. It's a treacherous five-hour hike. The team includes experts from around the world, including Canada's David Rohrer. The level of destruction was uh, enormous. You couldn't tell that you had an Airbus A310 aircraft there. I mean, you couldn't even tell you had two engines. The first big question they have is how did Thai Airways Flight 311 end up here? The Airbus should never have been flying north of the airport. Right over there. An airport hangar in Kathmandu is the final stop on a long journey for wreckage collected from the mountainside. The Sherpas would bring down the pieces that we identified down to the landing zone. And then the uh, Nepalese army and their helicopters would put them in nets and, and then sling them down to the hangar at the airport. As team members comb through the wreckage, the investigation takes an unexpected turn. Excuse me, can I help you? During the investigation, one of the family members was asking for a circuit board uh, just because they somehow would link them to their loved one. The unusual request leads to an incredible find. That's when we actually found the uh, internal mechanism of the, uh, of the recorder we were missing, which is quite amazing. The FDR should provide crucial data on the plane's speed, direction, and altitude throughout the flight. You always hope that luck is on your side, that things will happen to your benefit, and those are the kind of moments you really hope for as an investigator. It's the breakthrough they've been waiting for, evidence that could reveal how a plane flying south of the airport ended up slamming into mountains to its north. Did the pilots understand the flight systems well enough? Only the voice recorder can provide answers. <laughs> Captain Kevin Stables is preparing to pilot Emory Worldwide Flight 17. 
His first officer is George Land. They're hauling freight across the country aboard a 30-year-old DC-8 cargo plane. Uh, hi there. Is that the load plan? Just before they're finished up and loading the last uh, couple of containers, they would give us a list of all the freight containers and how much it weighed and what position on the airplane it was. There you go, boss. Then we'd take that information and we would calculate the weight and balance on the airplane and make sure that it was all correct. Airspeed's alive. Alive here. 80 knots. 80 knots. Elevator checks. Just another routine takeoff. V1. Rotate. But as the nose wheel leaves the ground, the DC-8 pitches upward much more steeply than it should. Watch the tail. They recognize that they have an issue during the course of the airplane actually starting to rotate as it lifts off the runway. V2. Positive rate. The sudden takeoff is quickly followed by an uncommanded left bank. I got it. You got it? Yeah. This is anything but routine. We're going back. What the hell? The center of gravity is way out of limits. They need to return to the airport as quickly as possible. Emery 17, emergency. Emery 17, say again. When a pilot declares an emergency, that really cues an air traffic controller to know that this isn't just an abnormal situation, this is a critical situation. The ground proximity warning begins to sound. We're sinking, we're going down, guys. All right, all right. Okay, we're going back up. The DC-8 starts climbing again. Roll out, roll out! But the pilots are still struggling for control. Uh, Emery 17, extreme balance problem. Emery 17, roger. The airplane started to go into these big perturbations, dive and then climb, dive and then climb. They push their control columns all the way forward in a desperate effort to level the plane. Power. More? Yeah. Captain Stables and his crew have managed to get their crippled plane to within sight of the runway. It was working very well. He made it almost all the way around to the backside of the airport. They knew if they could get back to the airport, there was going to be crash fire rescue that would have been able then to help them. They've now got less than a mile to go. They're still trying to look ahead to figure out what needs to be done next. But they know that sooner or later, they got to get on the ground. Emory Flight 17 has crashed into a car scrapyard one mile east of Sacramento's Mather Airport. All three crew members are dead. The job of figuring out why this happened now falls to the National Transportation Safety Board. Hey. This place is a mess. Yeah. With so much fire damage and thousands of car parts on site, just finding the airplane wreckage is going to be a huge challenge. The NTSB's John Golia helps lead the effort. Put this in the plane bin for me, please. Mechanical pieces, especially after they're burned, it's very difficult to tell a piece from an automobile to from a piece from an airplane. So I looked at the scene and said, wow, we got a real tiger by the tail here. Investigators will have to sift through a debris field about 450 feet wide and a quarter of a mile long. Now that looks like uh, wiring from a car. The team soon makes a crucial find. The most important items of evidence in any air crash investigation. 
Well done, guys. We did find both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder, which actually sped up that part of the investigation because we could send those two boxes back on the airplane that we had flown in on. The NTSB sends the critical recording devices to Washington, where lab technicians can begin the job of processing the data. At the same time, investigators hunt down as much other evidence as they can. They learned that Flight 17 was carrying nothing unusual, mostly clothing. But they wonder, did the positioning of the freight cause a dangerous imbalance? If you look at an airplane, there is a point in the middle of the airplane that is the center, and everything flows around it. So if you have too much weight in the back, right, the center of gravity is going to shift to the rear, and the airplane is going to fly differently. All right, this looks a little lighter than usual, but it's well within the center of gravity limits. Load distribution was not the culprit. Something else must have caused the crash. The team is soon chasing a new lead. Past complaints to the FAA from Emory pilots. It seems some pilots were worried about how the company was securing its cargo. They reported seeing frayed straps and netting. You know, if Emory was lax with their unloading practices, the load could have shifted. What if the cargo wasn't properly secured? They examined cargo fasteners recovered from the wreckage. If there was a load shift, the metal clamps, known as bear claws, should display distinct damage. All right, let's take a look at these things. When we're looking at these bear claws, we're looking for physical evidence. That is, if the pallet was clamped in place and the energy from the impact pushed it, it would typically break it or leave a witness mark or impact mark. They find no such evidence. All of these restraints look just fine. The thing is, if there wasn't a problem in the cargo hold, why were the pilots reporting a problem with their center of gravity? Is that the CVR? Oh, finally. All right, let's do this. They hope the cockpit voice recorder from Emory Flight 17 will provide some answers. Transasia Flight 222 has crashed into the village of Shishi, less than a mile from the Taiwanese airport where it was scheduled to land. Taiwanese rescuers race to the crash site of Transasia Flight 222. They soon discover that of the 58 people who were on board, 48 are dead. At investigation headquarters in Taipei, the team begins sorting evidence while they wait to see what the black box data will reveal about the Transasia crash. What have you found? But already, media reports are filled with speculation. People are saying that the typhoon caused the crash. Well, let's see what effect the typhoon had. They need to know how the distant typhoon was affecting airport weather conditions at the moment of the crash. They take a closer look at the weather data. Uh, wind speed 11 knots, gusting to 21 knots, but within the operational limits of the aircraft. They calculate that winds may have been strong enough to push the commuter plane off course, but not enough to cause a catastrophic upset. What about the visibility? I've got images from the airport at that time. Visibility will be a very key issue for us to understand whether the flight crew can visually locate the runway or not. They know that Transasia 222 crashed at 7.06 p.m. The airport images from just before that time reveal some stunning evidence. It's starting to be more than just brain. That's, that's a serious storm. After 7 o'clock start to, to get in stronger, we got heavy rain shower and the, the visibility decrease very quickly just after uh, 7 o'clock. Pilots are required to have a minimum range of clear visibility in order to land. 
Investigators estimate that at the time of the crash, visibility was so limited, the Transasia crew would not have been able to see the runway until they were practically on top of it. Visibility can't be more than a couple hundred meters. How could they have been allowed to land? Transasia Flight 222 has crashed into the village of Shishi, less than a mile from the Taiwanese airport where it was scheduled to land. The team begins sorting evidence while they wait to see what the black box data will reveal about the Transasia crash. At a nearby hangar, investigators sift through the remains of Transasia Flight 222. They're looking for any sign of a mechanical fault, anything that could explain why the aircraft veered off course and crashed short of the runway. So we check all the control service and the, the control linkage, and we check the power plant. They find nothing that points to a control service having failed in flight. Both of the turboprop engines appear to be mechanically sound and their electronic circuitry all looks normal. But we find there, there's no evidence to show that there's a existing mechanical problem or engine problem. The careful analysis leaves no doubt. Flight 222 was not brought down by a mechanical or systems failure. Investigators are going to need another theory. Air crash investigators in Dallas are trying to figure out why Delta Airlines Flight 1141 crashed on takeoff. There was a lot of traffic at Dallas-Fort Worth. We could be looking at a wingtip vortex. Wingtip vortices are spirals of air that trail off the tips of an airplane's wings. The heavier the plane, the bigger the vortex. These tornado-like winds can sometimes be strong enough to pose an invisible hazard to other planes. Was Flight 1141 cleared for takeoff too soon, bringing it too close to the plane ahead? Air traffic records show that the plane that took off just before Flight 1141 was Delta Airlines Flight 1486, another Boeing 727. They get takeoff clearance at 8.59.17. In this case, we did calculate the probable location of the wingtip vortices for the airplanes that were nearest to the accident airplane. By then, the other Delta plane was off the ground and already 7,000 feet ahead of them. Investigators know that the minimum Federal Aviation Authority requirement for separation between flights is 6,000 feet. We found that even assuming the vortices stayed as strong as they could possibly stay and that they moved in a, in a manner that put them as close as possible to the accident airplane, that they would still be a significant distance away from the accident aircraft. The failed takeoff of Delta 1141 is still a mystery. Crash site wreckage of Delta Airlines Flight 1141 suggests the 727 may not have been properly configured for takeoff. Okay, you ready? But is there anything on the recording that can back up that theory? I forgot to get my paycheck. Did you get yours? Yeah, I got mine. They should be focused on the flight, not talking about paychecks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are number four for departure. Attendance. Prepare the cabin, please. We are ready. Thank you. So far, they've heard nothing about the flap configuration. But what they hear next is another surprise. We might as well start. Number three, start valve open. 141 taxi to position runway 18 left and hold. Okay, 1141's position and hold. Hold up a minute, stop. Here's where the controller bumps them into first position and they've just restarted the engine. So they did get a little rush there, and, and it was attributed to having the flight attendant in the cockpit and, and the casual conversations that were going on. And they hit all the items on the checklist. You could go right down the checklist, and they, they got them all. 
Once again, the no flaps theory is in question. But investigators may have a way to resolve the flap issue once and for all. Let's dig up the jack screws. Ah, oh, perfect. A device called a jack screw is an integral part of the flap system. As it turns, it moves a nut that extends or retracts the flaps. It's the conclusive proof they need. The flaps were not extended before takeoff. But the finding leaves them with another puzzling question. So why did the pilots think they were extended? Let's go back to the start of the takeoff checklist. The team returns to the cockpit recording, hoping to hear something that might explain the discrepancy. Shoulder harness. They're on. Flaps. 1515 green light. Flap controls. Tops and bombs are checked. Air instruments. They're set. Takeoff briefing is complete. There was less than one second between the flaps call and his response. There's no way he had time to check and see if the flaps were actually out. Investigators are convinced, despite his response, the first officer could not have extended or even checked the flaps in the time available. The mystery of the flaps is finally solved. A rushed checklist led the Delta pilots to think that their plane was ready for takeoff when it was anything but. There's still one critical question. The alarm would have saved them. Why didn't it sound? Days after the crash of flight MH17 in eastern Ukraine, Dutch investigators are nowhere to be seen. Without access to the wreckage, they risk losing crucial evidence. Despite the setback, the Dutch team refuses to let any speculation about the crash affect their investigation. Best bet, it was shot down. Proving it without any uh, wreckage is nearly impossible. They may be able to disprove other theories being floated in the media. Speculation that flight MH17 may have encountered severe weather, or a technical malfunction, or some other rare calamity. Okay, let's start eliminating other possibilities and um, we'll see what we're left with. We started from, from square one and we looked to all the possibilities one by one in a very structural uh, manner. Okay, let's zoom into the crash area. Okay, this is MH17's intended flight path. Now this is the weather at the time of the crash. Well, what about lightning? Let's check the ATC report. Oh, look here. This is their intended path right into the storm. But they requested a deviation. The crew circumnavigated the thunderstorm, which is a normal uh, operational action. They bypassed the storm. It wasn't lightning. You think in the maintenance records? These are some of the cleanest occurrence reports I've seen. The technical log's the same. This was a well-maintained airplane. We didn't find any worthiness or maintenance factors that could have factored in the investigation. They even look into the remote possibility that MH17 was hit by a meteor. If it was brought down by a meteor, this is how we'll know. Ultra noise from the day of the crash. Ultra noise is a distinct sound wave that can be measured when a meteor decelerates as it enters the Earth's upper atmosphere. It could happen once every 60,000 years. It is possible, except not this time. There was no meteor activity that day at all. Three possible causes. No likely explanations for what brought down MH17. Those were all excluded because of the evidence we found. It did not match the expected evidence uh, you would see with these kind of uh, uh, possible causes. Investigators will need to see the wreckage. But so far, they still haven't been able to gain access to the crash sites. 
In Jakarta, the search for answers to what brought down a Sukhoi demonstration flight takes investigators to air traffic control. So, can you tell me what happened? Well, they were just supposed to do a 30-minute loop. Then before I knew it, they had disappeared from radar. So what did they end up at Mount Selak? I don't know. But weren't you supposed to be monitoring them? I was so busy. I lost track of the plane. Investigators learned that the controller had an exceptionally heavy workload. He was monitoring about a dozen flights. EY7136, cleared to land. JT792, continue approach to runway 24. Making matters worse, both his assistant and his supervisor were absent that shift. He was doing three jobs. Why did you clear them to fly at 6,000 feet? You must have known they would never clear the mountain. My system said it was a military jet. Investigators discover that the airport status system had incorrectly labeled the plane as SU-30, which identifies it as a Sukhoi military aircraft. Military can fly pretty much as low as they want. Jakarta Control, Sukhoi 36801, requesting descent at 6,000. When the pilots requested a descent, the controller assumed they were heading for a military training area in Bogor, right along the Sukhoi's flight path. Sukhoi 36801, cleared to 6,000 feet. EY7136, cleared to land. JT792, continue approach to runway 24. The ATC thought that it was a military aircraft flying in a military airspace, so 6,000 is not a concern for them. But I still don't understand why was the plane so far off course? That's a good question. I really don't know. I want to know more about how this tall system works. The investigative spotlight now shines on one of the Sukhoi Superjet's most important safety systems. It's called TAWS, Terrain Awareness and Warning System. Using GPS, it tracks the plane's heading and predicts when it's at risk of colliding with terrain. It's designed to alert pilots in plenty of time to respond. Maybe the system somehow failed. While investigators wait for the cockpit voice recorder, they start with a flight data recorder, which was recovered 21 days after the crash. This is the original flight path here. And we know from the controllers that they requested permission to do an extra 360 degree turn. But the question is, how did they end up here? The flight path data shows the plane's exact route. As he's going southwest, He's on a heading of 240 degrees. It also shows all compass headings entered by the pilots. As he starts to loop down, he changes to 333 degrees. At first, everything seems to be going according to plan. But then, investigators discover something they can't explain. That? The last input was 174 heading south, over here, right here. He should have put in another input heading back to the north. A compass heading of 174 degrees took the plane south into the mountain. The pilot needed to input another heading of 333 degrees to turn the plane back towards Holly Airport. Investigators wonder if the navigation system somehow failed, leading the pilots off course. Flight systems look fine. Next, they look at how the terrain warning system performed. Did it alert the pilots to impending danger? There's TOS warnings. The data shows that TOS sent out multiple alerts in the final 40 seconds of flight. I don't get it. If the warnings work, then these guys would have known what to do. Investigators are stumped. Flight data shows the captain made no attempt to turn the plane. Even more baffling, the TAWS system was deactivated 28 seconds before the crash. Why that happened is a complete mystery.
Qantas Airways Flight 72 cruises above the Indian Ocean headed for Western Australia. Flight 72 departed from Singapore. The flight path covers almost 2,500 miles across the Southern Indian Ocean to Perth, Australia. All right, Ross, out of my way. Captain's back in action. Captain Kevin Sullivan is a former Top Gun fighter pilot with the US Navy. Ross Hales is the second officer. First officer Peter Lipsat is the next pilot scheduled to go on break. So Peter, what's the update? We're 100 nautical miles from the coast. Learmonth is to our left and still cruising at 37,000 feet. All right, have a good rest. Perfect weather is making for a comfortable flight. We're over the ocean and things are very smooth. Any changes? Altitude and airspeed's the same. Smooth sailing. But don't tell me I just jinxed us. The captain notices his autopilot is no longer engaged. Autopilot one disconnects, and now I'm hand flying. It's a bit annoying, but we have two systems. Engaging autopilot two. I engaged autopilot two, and no sooner had I done that than we started getting overspeed and stall warnings. Stall. The cam's showing a lot of errors. Stall. Overspeed warning. Stall. How can we be in a stall and overspeed at the same time? Stall. We can't. Airspeed's unreliable. Disconnecting autopilot. That's the first phase of unreliable speed memory checklist. Autopilot off. And I'm hand flying now, manually flying. Flight attendant Fuzzy Mayaba finally has a moment to grab a bite to eat. And so I focused probably on the timer. 13 seconds. 13 seconds was the actual time. All I could see was the floor disappearing, like away from my feet. We were going up. Sudden G-forces pull passengers up from their seats. Anyone not strapped in hits the cabin ceiling. And next minute, bang. I must have hit the ceiling because it knocked me out. And I'm not sure how long it was for uh, maybe two, three seconds, tens. I, I, I just wasn't sure. The G force was enough, even with our three point harness, to lift us both out of the seat and push us forward as well. That's quite disorienting. Flight 72 is suddenly in a dangerous nosedive. Captain Sullivan grabs the side stick to try to level his plane. It doesn't respond. Once I pulled back on the stick and nothing happened, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not in control of this plane. Investigators from the Australian Transport Safety Bureau arrive in Learmonth. In the cabin, there was quite a lot of damage, mainly to the ceiling panels and the ceiling fixtures. Investigators hope data from the plane's quick access recorder can shed light on what went wrong. They focus on the fly-by-wire control system. I'm seeing two abrupt changes in the elevator's position at cruise. Looks like that's what caused the pitch downs. Were those commands coming from the pilots? Oh, they weren't. Weird. Navire one fault. That's not right. It seems the plane's fly-by-wire system was sending rogue commands to the flight control surfaces. What the hell is going on? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey. Investigators hey. need to hear the pilot's story. We went through everything that they recalled and 
any anything unusual in the, in the period beforehand. Describe the flight leading up to the pitch downs. Anything that could have caused these erratic movements. They had a, a pretty good recollection, but had no explanations as to why this happened. And you were getting a lot of faults. Oh yeah, there were a few. Have a look for yourself. It's like the plane had a mind of its own. The A330's post-flight report logs all the cautions and warnings that were affecting the plane. They studied the list, looking for anything that might connect the various warnings. The first question you have is, what's the common element between all these? All these errors are connected to Adaru 1. The Adaru, or Air Data Inertial Reference Unit, relays important information to the flight computers about the environment outside the plane. That Adaru obviously became a, an important part of the puzzle because it was associated with so many faults. Look at this. I've never seen anything like it. They spot something highly unusual. These are wild angle of attack fluctuations coming from AOA-1. Angle of attack, or AOA, is the angle of the plane's wing relative to airflow. The higher the angle, the less smooth the airflow over the wing. And if the aircraft uh, angle of attack gets too high, then the aircraft can stall. So it's a very important parameter. From over 50 degrees nose up, back to level, then negative 50 degrees. That's not what the pilots described at all. The crew testified that the plane pitched nose down twice. They never said it pitched up. What do the elevator readings say? 10 degrees nose down. He checks other FDR readings that record the plane's pitch. That data also confirms what the crew reported. Show me the angle of attack again. From the flight data recorder information, we could see that the elevators moved in a nose down direction, about 10 degrees. There was an abrupt rate of change. The plane did not pitch up. There's no way this AOA data is correct. What will faulty data like this do to an A330? I'm not sure, but I bet it's not good. Let's go ask Airbus. Joining the investigation is Bob Benson of the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. Because the aircraft was manufactured in the United States, our role is really to assist the Swiss government um, in determining what happened. It looked to us like the aircraft had, had struck the trees in, in a bit of a level attitude, uh, although parts of the right wing had, had been sheared off by the trees, and that caused a uh, more lift to occur on the on the left side of the aircraft, causing the aircraft to roll. So the eventual impact was nearly inverted. So they were cleared for runway 14. Looks like they're on the right heading. They're way too low. It's like they don't even know the hill's there. Investigators begin with the flight data, looking for any sign of a mechanical problem on board. Thrust is good. Pitch and roll, fine. Flaps, good. Yep. No stabilization problems. Everything seems normal from a mechanical standpoint. Even the glide is smooth and straight. It's just all over a thousand feet too low. Okay. Can we do a radio approach? Yes. All right, just over 4,000 feet We're in here, which is well below the glide slope. Okay, so, but they need to level off to capture the glide, but they kept ascending. On one. Let's do it on one. Radio one confirmed. ILS transmitters send radio signals to two navigational receivers in the cockpit, nav radio one and nav radio two. The pilots can use either one to guide the plane. Investigators now know the crew selected Nav Radio 1, but they're still hoping to discover something about the unusually low glide slope and about the GPWS. 
Alitalia 404, reduced to 160 knots. Reducing 160. That's your glide path. So we're on the beam. Did you stop it there? On the beam? You're well below the glide slope there. They are more than 1,000 feet below it. So why is the captain saying then that he captured it? What they're hearing from the cockpit only deepens the mystery. Did they misread the altimeter and the glide slope? I mean, that doesn't seem possible. Let's keep listening for the GPWS. OK. Flaps 25. Flaps 25. The outer marker check is at 1,250 feet, almost four miles. Didn't we pass it? Didn't we pass the outer marker? No. No, it hasn't changed yet. Something in that cockpit is confusing these pilots. I'll tell you 404, speed as convenient. Contact tower 118.1. 118.1, goodbye. That doesn't make sense to me. Go around. No, no, no. Hold the glide. And the CVR had the first officer attempting to go around and then being countermanded by the captain. There was a lot of confusion there. Can you hold it? Yes, sir. Investigators are stunned both by what they've heard and by what they haven't heard. No ground proximity warnings at all. And the captain called off a go around. They now face more questions than ever. The crew of Alitalia Flight 404 is nearing the end of an evening flight to Zurich, Switzerland. Alitalia 404, fly heading 325 radar vectors to ILS 14. Radar vectors to runway 14 on heading 325. Captain Raffaele Liberti is a senior Alitalia pilot with more than 20 years' experience. How much is the visibility? Visibility is nine kilometers. First Officer Massimo De Freya is the pilot flying the plane tonight. He's new to the airline, having joined just last year. The plane is a McDonnell Douglas DC-9 that's been flying since 1974. The DC-9 was one of the mainstays of the industry in the, from the 1960s through the 2000s. It was very, very popular in the US, Western Europe, and around the world. Flight 404 left Milan's Lanate Airport 25 minutes ago. The flight path takes it almost directly north over the Alps to Zurich's Kloten Airport. At Zurich Air Traffic Control, it's a busy evening. Swiss 3611, maintain 230. Alitalia 404 is lining up for its approach to the airport. The pilots are preparing for what's called an ILS, or Instrument Landing System, approach. The instrument Landing System is a series of technologies, primarily radio transmitters on the ground, that allows an aircraft to align itself both vertically and horizontally with the runway. Alitalia 404 reduced to 180 knots. Reducing 180404. Do you have the glide slope? Uh, it's on one. Let's do it on one. The crew sets the navigation instruments to pick up the ILS signal from the runway. Radio unconfirmed. There is a set of signals which goes out at an angle from the ground that gives them an idea of the glide slope. Captured loke, captured glide path, so we're on the beam. Flight 404 is third in line on approach with the runway 12 miles straight ahead. The pilots can't see it yet, but their navigation instruments show they are locked on to the proper signals. All they need to do now to finalize the approach is intercept a radio beacon known as the outer marker. The outer marker check is at 1,250 feet, almost four miles. Didn't we pass it? Didn't we pass the outer marker? No, no, it hasn't changed yet. 
Alitalia 404, speed as convenient. Contact tower 118.1. 118.1, goodbye. That doesn't make sense to me. The runway should be just ahead, but the first officer still can't see it. Something's not right. Go around. No, 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 no. Hold the glide. Can you hold it? Yes, sir. The next morning, investigators from Japan's Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission survey the devastation. The Airbus is completely destroyed, shattered into thousands of scorched pieces. They have no idea why, and everyone wants answers. Make sure you get shots of everything. Investigators hope the debris field can help them piece together what happened. Nagakatsu Kawahata is working with the Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission. The scattered parts give us hints about the accident. For example, if metal parts were worn out and had disintegrated in the air, we would see evidence of that. They didn't miss by much. Approximately 360 feet east from the runway, the plane crashed just to the side of the airport's one runway. Why would a sophisticated aircraft with an experienced captain end up here? Impact scars. The soft earth by the runway offers clues. Investigators find a series of scars where the plane hit the ground. This one's much deeper. Looks like left side landing gear. The evidence paints a picture of how the plane came down. At a four degree nose up angle and leaning to the left. The landing gear hit first, then the left and right engines. The wings were ripped from the fuselage, rupturing the fuel tanks. The question now is why was the plane coming in at such a sharp angle? Mind if I record our conversation? Go right ahead. Investigators hope the air traffic controller has some answers. Any idea why the plane missed the runway? None. They got a bit close to another plane on approach, but I slowed them down. Reducing 180 knots. A few minutes later, I cleared them to land, and they copied that. Cleared to land runway 34. And I heard nothing until they said they were going around. How'd the pilot sound when he radioed for the go-around? A little rushed, but not panicked. And he didn't say why? No. A go-around isn't considered an emergency situation. The Goya Tower Dynasty going around. It's used to avoid one. Go-around mode is a series of commands sent from the flight management system. It'll apply the climb thrust required to bring it up to a safe altitude after an approach has been aborted. Roger, stand by for further instructions. The controller acknowledged the go-around procedure. But just moments later, the Airbus hit the ground. didn't hear from them again. It was all so fast. The interview only deepens the mystery. Thank you. I'll let you know if I have any other questions. Right. Investigators still don't know why the crew called for a go around or why it went so wrong. Japanese investigators call on Airbus for help. Thanks for coming. The French manufacturer sends a technical expert who knows the A300 inside and out. I've been examining these instruments, but I'd like to get your take. 
confident that the plane's engines and wing flaps were not factors in the crash, investigators turned their attention to the cockpit instruments. In any accident investigation, you want to document the cockpit, document the position of switches, any indicators that might show what the position was at impact. They focus on the thrust levers. They're going to tower down to steep going around. Were the thrust levers in the right position to provide enough power for a go around? Forward position, right where we want it. To investigators, it looks like they were. And it matches what the controller told them about Flight 140 requesting a go around. Roger, stand by for further instructions. So the flight computer would have kicked in for the go around mode. Mm -hmm. What investigators have uncovered so far is puzzling. It appears the plane was properly configured to perform a flawless go around. The flaps and slaps were set, the engines were at full power, everything was where it needed to be. So what went wrong? To understand the fatal crash of Flight 140, investigators first need to figure out why the Air China pilots aborted their landing just moments from the runway. Are we ready? They now have an important tool to help them. In 1994, the digital flight data recorder is relatively new. The data should reveal if there was an onboard system malfunction or any alarm warning that landing would be unsafe. This is the timeline of the airspeed. Investigators can see that the speed drops on the initial approach when the Air China crew is dealing with wake turbulence. Better reduce the speed a little more, reduce it to 170. But the speed only drops slightly. Speed is still good for an approach, nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Clear to land, run. The turbulence didn't prompt the pilots to go around. The buffeting stopped in plenty of time for a safe landing. As Flight 140 descends towards 1,000 feet, everything looks normal. They activate the go-around mode right here. I don't get it. Why would they do that? Everything seems fine. The black box data leads investigators to turn a spotlight on the pilots themselves. What were these guys thinking? Digging into their personnel files, they learned that the first officer joined China Airlines as a student, training on small aircraft before working up to the A300. He made first officer just a year before the crash. The China Airlines practice is for new pilots to keep learning on the job with an experienced captain at their side. Captain Wang Lo Chi, 42 years old. Captain Wang should have been up to the task. He had more than 8,000 flight hours over a 24-year career. But when investigators drill down, it's not so clear-cut. Not a lot of time in the Airbus. They learned that the captain flew Boeing 747s for most of his time at China Airlines and just as a first officer. He was only promoted to captain a year ago when he started flying the A300. He was as new to the plane as his first officer with just over 1,300 flight hours. So you have a captain that's come from an older generation of airplanes and you have a first officer that's come from a newer generation of airplanes but only from a school background. So that's two relatively new pilots on the same airplane. By 1994, there were hundreds of A300s in the skies. Airlines needed trained pilots to fly these technologically advanced aircraft. The crew on the accident flight was part of this surge. It's okay, just do it slowly. Did the pilots understand the flight systems well enough? Only the voice recorder can provide answers.
The morning light reveals the full extent of the crash. The La Mia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain called Cerro Gordo. The plane was configured for landing. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. But it crashed 10 miles short of the runway. Cathay Pacific Flight 780 is cruising at 38,000 feet over the South China Sea. Captain Malcolm Waters and his crew are nearing the end of a four and a half hour flight from Indonesia to Hong Kong. 165 miles from Hong Kong airport, the Airbus leaves cruising altitude and begins its descent. And then something goes wrong. The flight computer is alerting the pilots to a problem. Okay, let's see what we got. Engine two stall. The plane's monitoring system indicates there's an issue with the right engine, engine number two. With no explanation for the incident, Captain Waters reduces power on the engine to idle to protect it from damage. Idle. The lowest possible power level while still keeping it running. The pilots prepare to land the Airbus with only one engine. Everything is set for an emergency landing. But then, another alert and more vibrations. Engine one stall. Engine one stall confirmed. Things have gone from bad to worse. The monitoring system indicates they've just lost the other engine, the one they were counting on to get the plane to Hong Kong. The monitoring system tells the pilots to put the malfunctioning engine number one into idle. They are a minute from touchdown. Then, another alert. It's overspeed. It's an overspeed warning, a signal the aircraft is flying too fast. Captain Waters can't figure it out. They should be slowing down. He rechecks the controls. Then, he sees it. Engine number one, which he throttled back minutes earlier, is still running at 74% power. High thrust, too high to land safely. Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Their speed is over 100 terrain. miles per hour faster than normal. So fast, the flight computer doesn't recognize that the pilots are trying to land. Captain Waters pushes the nose down, forcing the Airbus onto the runway. is getting close to the end of the runway. Finally, the aircraft comes to a halt just a short distance from the water's edge. They've used up more than 8,800 feet over a mile and a half of runway. Once the aircraft did stop, there's a look of what the hell just happened. In Hong Kong, a team of investigators begins trying to unravel the mystery of Cathay Pacific Flight 780's two malfunctioning engines. They retrieve the black box flight data recorder from the rear of the aircraft. It contains information about the plane's functions throughout the flight. The data on board the aircraft is, is key in this type of investigation. Investigators upload the data from the recorder. We need to see throttle position and fuel flow. The device records 359 data parameters. They focus in on the A330's engine functions. Stop. What's going on here? Right away, they notice something unusual. Thrust levers are moving, but fuel flow's flatlining. 
After the pilots had tried to restore power to the engines by pushing the throttle up, the fuel flow remained the same. So the warnings that were coming up were warnings to do with the main metering valve supplying fuel to the engine. The main metering valve is made up of a piston that slides within a cylinder. When pilots move the thrust levers, it increases or decreases the flow of fuel to the A330's turbofan engines. That valve wasn't moving, uh, wasn't able to respond to the commands. To figure out why the metering valve malfunctioned, the investigators send it to Rolls-Royce for analysis. After cutting open the valve to study it... That's not normal, is it? They find something they've never seen before. A strange white substance coating the walls of the valve. X-ray analysis reveals the chemical makeup of the material. It shows that the powder is a type of superabsorbent polymer, or SAP. When it comes into contact with water, it creates a gel-like substance. The investigators know that the powder is used in refueling trucks to prevent water from getting into aircraft fuel tanks. The refueling trucks pump fuel from underground tanks and pipes through a filter on the truck and into the aircraft. If the fuel is contaminated with water, the powder in the filter absorbs it by forming a gel inside the filter. But the waterlogged gel is supposed to stay in the filter. It should never end up in the fuel. It is so commonly used within the industry for this purpose of filtering out water. What we didn't understand was how did it get on board the aircraft? Reno, Nevada. Desert town and the state's original gaming capital. Today, Reno is hosting a very different kind of high stakes game. A gamble in the sky known as the National Championship Air Races. About 100,000 spectators attend this five-day event to watch everything from biplanes to jets zoom around an eight-mile course in the desert. The highlight at Reno is the Unlimited Class Championship race. Unlimited because it includes a range of both modified and stock World War II fighters. The course is marked by 10 pylons, 50-foot tall poles planted in the desert. The finish line is right in front of the grandstand. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good. Hand me that ratchet, way. At 74, race pilot Jimmy Leeward is a legend in Reno. He's raced here for 30 years. Today, Jimmy's flying a highly modified P-51 Mustang fighter. Since Jimmy's plane was built, it's been heavily modified to reduce drag and increase speed. Good luck, Jimmy. See you, Hood. We're going to break a record today. Wish I could be up there with you. <laughs> if Jimmy can get the galloping ghost to break 500 miles an hour, his prediction will come true. At 4.05, the last qualifying heat for the unlimited class is set to go. The galloping ghost accelerates for takeoff. On the ground, Jimmy's team tracks the galloping ghost on their flight data monitoring system. Speed, engine performance, oil pressure, and more. Everything is working perfectly. As the galloping ghost rounds pylon eight, it suddenly pitches up hard. Jimmy Leeward's galloping ghost is now out of control over the grandstand and dives toward a crowd of helpless spectators. just nine seconds, this race has turned into a nightmare. It's the worst disaster in the history of the Reno Air Races. The worst year that we had had previously was 2007, where three pilots died. 
but never before had we injured a spectator. That's a fuselage. Oh, I don't know, Howard. Trying to ID these pieces seems almost impossible. You're right. It looks like a scrap heap. <laughs> One week after Jimmy Leeward's modified P-51 Mustang crashed at the Reno Air Races, NTSB investigators still don't understand what caused the disaster. So far, the investigator's biggest clue is an eight-inch piece of trim tab that separated from the aircraft's tail section. But they have no idea how or why it broke off. You know, this plane flew in World War II. It was almost 70 years old, and it was highly modified for speed. Maybe it was too modified. Crookshanks and Plagans wonder if years of modifications to the Galloping Ghost turned a sturdy fighter into an unstable racing machine. They now need to look into how it was altered. We had to learn quite a bit about the P-51, and all the information we had was on the stock airplane. Boot Gibson tells investigators he thinks the Ghost was the most modified P-51 that ever raced in the unlimited class. It had the most radically clipped wings of any P-51 Mustang ever. Gibson helps the NTSB investigators compare the P-51's original blueprints to the rebuilt Galloping Ghost. In the war, the P-51 needed all this wing for long-range missions. But a race is only 50 miles. Jimmy needed speed, not range. They discover that in the 60s, the Galloping Ghost had its wings shortened by eight feet and its tail by one foot changes that made the plane lighter and more streamlined. Less wing. I see he overhauled his engine. Took his top speed from 300 to 500 miles an hour, maybe more. Wow. But there's one big problem. You find anything on the flight tests? Nothing. The zip. There are no records of Leeward ever flight testing the modifications. Investigators can't be sure if the changes he made were safe. It was incredibly frustrating that there was no information. The fact that there was no testing of any of the modifications was alarming to us. In a hangar at Schiphol Airport, researchers with the Netherlands Aviation Safety Board scour the wreckage for clues to explain the crash of Flight 433. They need to know if the plane suffered a flight control malfunction. We want to exclude all possible factors that could have contributed to the accident. Uh, let's start with the rudder. The investigation team knows the plane veered to the right during the landing attempt, but they don't know why. In the air, Pilots move the rudder left and right to control the plane's yaw, or horizontal rotation. It's a critical control service for helping them line up with the runway. The investigators want to see if the rudder malfunctioned just before landing. They need to examine the rudder locking device. It's used to lock the rudder in place to prevent it from moving in a heavy wind while on the ground. Did the rudder lock somehow engage during flight, causing a catastrophic loss of control? Can I take a look? A rudder lock, if it would be still on, would certainly degrade the authority of the rudder. So you check that. They study the rudder components. They look for any sign of a malfunction in the gust lock system. There's nothing wrong with it. The lock is fine. We didn't find anything wrong with the gust lock. Further analysis reveals that all of the plane's other flight control services were also working properly. Flaps 20. Flaps 
20. The cause of the deadly disaster lies somewhere else. KLM 43, can you give me any details? The investigators know that the KLM pilots reported an oil pressure problem. KLM 433, situation's under control. We have an engine oil pressure problem in engine number two. They need to know what that problem was and if it contributed to the crash. Well, turbines are moving. There's no evidence that the engines overheated or seized up due to a lack of oil. Any damages from the impact? Not from oil pressure. There's no evidence of any oil pressure issues at all. It appears the pilots reported a problem that didn't exist. Testing the oil pressure gauges and warning systems from the Saab 340 should tell investigators if the KLM pilots were getting accurate oil pressure readings. There's nothing wrong here. The gauge is working fine. They find no malfunction in the oil pressure gauge. Hold on. That shouldn't happen. But the warning light is another matter. OK, let's, uh, let's do it again. Okay. Hmm. That's strange. It's uh, giving an intermittent warning. It's another surprising discovery. The oil pressure warning light sometimes activates even when the pressure is normal. Digging deeper, they examine the switch that controls the warning light. There's a short circuit in the switch. Now they understand what the pilots were seeing, a false warning. Right engine oil pressure. An electrical short in the oil pressure switch caused the warning light to come on when it shouldn't have. The oil pressure warning itself was false, and the engine was operating normally. So, they were seeing a false warning, but that doesn't explain the accident. The discovery raises as many questions as it answers. A false warning alone shouldn't lead to a crash. While they wait for the black box data, the investigators interview witnesses to understand what happened to Flight 808. So you saw the whole thing? Yeah, I watched him come in. They learned that the pilots of a U.S. Navy transport watched the plane's final moments. Here it comes. On 10. They were near the runway when Flight 808 began its approach. We were fortunate there was a C-130 crew, so you have some qualified pilots who are actually watching this airplane, the DC-8, as it was trying to, uh, to land on runway 10. The DC-8 was turning toward the runway when something went wrong. They described that when they watched the airplane as it turned towards runway 10, the bank angle continuously increased. It's not going to make it. No way. U.S. Navy pilots watching Flight 808's landing approach fear they're witnessing a disaster in the making. Come on, level off, man, level off. Normally, you don't want to be turning more than about 10, 20 degrees on final approach. They watched this airplane as it went from 30 degrees to 40 degrees to 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and they were really surprised. And then they saw the wings go about 90 degrees relative to the horizon. The nose pitched down, and the airplane struck the ground. Sounds like a wing stall. Yes, sir, it sure look like it. Yeah. 
what the pilot describes sounds like a condition known as aerodynamic stall, where the wings aren't producing the lift needed to keep the plane in the air. So you now have the dynamic. You understand how the aircraft struck the ground. Now you have to determine why. The investigators learned that neither pilot had ever landed a DC-8 at Guantanamo. They wonder if the captain knew that runway 10 was a more challenging approach than runway 28. They studied the airline's procedures. They had to watch a video. That's it. Because of the difficulty landing at Guantanamo, military pilots require special training to land on runway 10. But the cargo airline only required its civilian pilots to watch a short video. Exercise extreme caution when landing on runway 10. Records show the captain and first officer had both watched the training video within the past year. Align your base leg just to the right of the strobe beacon. This beacon identifies the U.S.-Cuban boundary beginning at the shoreline. To avoid Cuban airspace on the left, the plane must make a tight right turn. Where's the strobe? Right over there. It, where? Right over there. It, where? The captain can't locate the strobe light that marks the Cuban border. You know, we're not getting airspeed back there. The flight engineer notices that the plane is still flying more than 10 knots too slow. Where's the strobe? Right down there. I, I still don't see it. Instead of increasing his airspeed, the captain keeps trying to find the strobe light. Flight engineer Richmond sees the DC-8 isn't properly positioned for the landing. Do you think you're going to make this? Yeah. If I can catch the strobe light. First Officer Curran is also concerned. But Captain Shapo isn't taking the hint. The DC-8 begins its critical final turn. The team needs to know why the crew didn't abandon an approach that was clearly going wrong. August 7th, 1997. Fine Air Cargo Flight 101 prepares to take off from Miami to the Dominican Republic. At 12.30 p.m., when Flight 101 taxis to its runway, First Officer Petrosky recites a familiar drill. Okay, standard fine air procedure. There's a problem prior to V1, which is 130 knots. The pilot in command will abort the airplane. Treat anything after V1 as an in-flight emergency. Sounds good. At 12.34, the tower makes contact. Fine Air 101, fly heading 270, cleared for takeoff. Clear takeoff 27 right. Fine Air 101 heavy. OK, force spooled and stable. Max power. OK, coming up on 60 knots, power set. 80. V1, rotate. The plane lifts off the runway. Okay, easy, 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 easy. You're up. alarmed by what he now sees. What's going on? Whoa! Whoa! The crew fights to get the plane under control. Too low. Gear. Too low. Too low. Terrain.
It's 70 seconds and 25th. It's the unthinkable, a plane crash in the heart of Miami. The plane's three-man crew and security guard are confirmed dead. Less than a mile from Miami International Airport is the scene of a terrifying airplane disaster. NTSB investigators start collecting eyewitness accounts. A couple of the witnesses mentioned seeing flames coming from the number four engine on the right side. The investigators wonder if the plane suffered a major engine failure, which prevented it from getting airborne. Bob Benson searches for a telltale clue that the engines were working. Turbine blades bent sideways suggest they were still spinning rapidly when the plane hit the ground. We looked inside them, and it looked like they were all operating at high power settings, just from visual examination. They were definitely spinning. The investigators rule out engine failure, but quickly get new information from the plane's air traffic controller. Just after takeoff, he, he went steeply nose up. I could see the tops of the wings. The discovery explains the flames witnesses saw. If a plane is pitched too steeply, airflow to the engine is interrupted, causing too much fuel to flow through the engines. It's simply an airflow issue. There wasn't enough air getting into the engines. And you get a lot of extra fuel that's on fire, and it's going out the back of the engine. NTSB investigator Evan Byrne now wonders why the plane's nose rose up so suddenly. What this told us early in the investigation was that we either had a problem with the airplane, something that the pilots did during the takeoff, or there may have been something wrong with the load. The NTSB has hit an impasse in its investigation into the fine air crash. The mystery of Flight 101 has only deepened. But then, the investigation gets a break. Benson. An informant calls with a guilty conscience. Who is this? OK, I'm listening. He won't disclose his identity, but the caller reveals there's extra weight on the plane that the investigators are overlooking. Their figures don't include the pallet or the netting. The investigators now calculate the weight of the cargo, including pallets and netting. It's more than 5,000 pounds of extra weight. Now we're getting somewhere. The added weight could have had an effect on the plane's balance. The NTSB investigators think Fine Air Flight 101 crashed because it was overweight. So they want to test their theory in a flight simulator. OK, we're good to go. 5,000 extra pounds have been added to reflect the true weight and balance of the aircraft. Benson's amazement, the plane lifts off without a problem. It rises in a stable climb. Damn. The pilots themselves were able to, to fly out of, out, out of the situation. Uh, and uh, we scratched our heads a bit. What am I missing? Benson's team needs to dig deeper if they hope to understand why the flight went so horribly wrong. Tarum Flight 371 has slammed into a farmer's field, just a few hundred yards from a local train station outside Bucharest. Romanian investigators are still searching for the cause of the crash. 
I felt the pressure from the media and internally within Taro after I was appointed as an investigator. Bodizantu needs to figure out if the airplane was mechanically sound. Was the A310 properly maintained? Had it been in for servicing recently? The passenger jet's logbook provides a detailed record of its flight and service history. It can tell investigators exactly what servicing and repairs the plane has undergone. Looking good so far. Bodizantu finds that all scheduled maintenance was performed on time. So nothing unusual? Only this. A couple of times in the previous year, the auto throttle hadn't moved properly during flight. The auto throttle commands the throttles to move whenever a change in power is required. On takeoff, the throttles are at maximum. Once the plane reaches the climb phase, less power is needed. The throttle should move slightly back automatically. Tarum pilots had complained that in climb mode, the throttle for the left engine sometimes moved too far back, all the way to idle. This placed the two engines at different power settings. Motuzantu discovers the auto throttle issue has been plaguing this plane for a very long time. In the last year alone, there's almost two dozen complaints about the auto throttle problem. This one's from the captain. Lead investigator Stoichescu discovers that Captain Baranayu himself had reported this very problem months ago. The captain recorded it in the plane's logbook. He did what the briefing card instructed and held the faulty thrust lever from moving back. Everything worked out fine. If you knew about this problem and you knew what to do, how could it have caused the accident? Searching to understand why Tarum Flight 371 slammed into the ground shortly after takeoff. V1, rotate. The investigators turn their attention to the pilots. They wonder if there's anything in their flight records to suggest they made a fatal mistake. Okay, let's go. The captain first. Captain Baranoyu spent his entire career at Taro. Graduated military flight school in 1969. He'd flown more than 14,000 flight hours on six different aircraft. Impressive, lots of flight hours. I flew with Captain Batanoyu. He was a prepared pilot, conscientious, attentive to what he was doing. Next. Pilot Stoy graduated military flight school in 1968. The first officer was also experienced. His training record is excellent. They were a good match. Yeah. So, two excellent pilots in the cockpit that day. Next, they check the medical records. Captain Batanayu, high mental condition, fit for long range flights. Captain looks good. The captain was 48 years old. The first officer, 51. But despite increasing age, their medical reports are both flawless. First Officer Stoy, close to retiring age. Good level of information processing, motivated for flight. Stable personality. Assessments of their physical and mental status lead to one conclusion. Both were medically and psychologically fit to fly. 
both plane and pilots have passed close inspection. What could have caused such a dramatic loss of control? Continental Airlines Flight 1404 is being prepped for its departure from Denver, Colorado. Captain David Butler and First Officer Chad LeVang will pilot the flight to Houston. The plane is a Boeing 737, a short to medium range twin engine jet that has become the best selling commercial jetliner in history. Continental 1404, Denver Tower. Runway 3-4 right, position and hold. Position hold 3-4 right, Continental 14-04. Runway 3-4 right is one of six runways at Denver International. Continental 14-04, wind 270 at 27. Turn right, heading 020. Runway 3-4 right is cleared for takeoff. The controller provides the pilots with a runway wind reading of 27 knots and clears them for takeoff. Heading 020, clear for takeoff, runway 34 right, Continental 1404. Suddenly, the plane veers hard to the left. races off the runway at a speed of more than 100 miles an hour. It's completely out of control. The plane hits a steep ridge, sending it airborne. finally comes to a stop 700 feet from the runway. All 110 passengers and five flight crew narrowly escape death. The captain is seriously injured. The first officer's injuries are minor. The question now is how could this have happened in the first place? Thank you. With the cause of Flight 1404's crash evading investigators, the NTSB must now consider factors outside the plane that could have contributed to the Boeing 737's fate. We missing anything? No. No, we got all I need. NTSB senior meteorologist Don Ike will investigate the weather conditions at the time of the crash. Reports from the National Weather Service indicate there was a low pressure system in parts of Colorado around the time of the crash. But it had no impact on Denver International. There was no severe weather at the time. Runway 34's surface was bare and dry. Well, whatever it was, it happened real fast. The investigators now turn their attention to the crosswinds during takeoff. It looks like weather vaning to me. Weather vaning occurs when a crosswind pushes a plane's tail, causing the nose to point into the wind. A pilot must apply rudder to counteract this movement. A 737-500 can handle crosswinds up to 33 knots, but if the gusts are stronger, it might have been enough to blow the plane off the runway. Bill English needs to confirm that the pilots weren't attempting to take off in crosswinds that exceeded the safety limits for the 737. All right, queue up with Adis. Main departure, runway three. Four. Prior to takeoff, the pilots would have received the current weather conditions from the Automatic Terminal Information Service, or ATIS. ATIS reported winds of 280 degrees at 11 knots, well under the 33-knot threshold. 
But pilots don't just rely on ATIS. Air traffic control also provides specific runway winds right before takeoff. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The investigators speak with a controller on duty that night. Thanks for taking the time for us. Of course. OK, so what were the conditions at takeoff? Well, I uh, checked the winds just before. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The controller told the crew to expect 27 knot winds on runway 34, a speed still below the crosswind limit of 33 knots. Anything else that could help explain what happened? No. I'm as stumped as you guys. Russian authorities work around the clock to clear the wreckage of Aeroflot Nord Flight 821 from the crash site on the Trans-Siberian Railway. They need to get the trains running again. Be careful with us. Bring them over here. Meanwhile, Russian investigators from the Interstate Aviation Committee, the IAC, will work to find the cause of the accident. Photos of Flight 821's crash site offer up clues about the orientation and pitch of the plane when it hit the ground. The flying control surfaces, the fuselage, the engines, totally destroyed. And it flew past the approach line. We need to find out why. The Russian investigators want to understand the reasons that led to such a catastrophic loss of control just minutes before landing. It was raining. Let's track down the weather chart. Thank you for making trip from Washington. I hope we can help. American investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board join the team. What about the uh, flight recorders? On the plane to France, they're in rough shape. The cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were badly damaged in the fire. They were sent to a specialized facility in France to retrieve the data. But it could take weeks to get the results. In the meantime, the Russian investigators briefed the Americans on their progress. We found no evidence of mechanical failure in the engines. What about an in-flight fire or breakup? The plane first hit these trees on the left embankment, and all the debris was confined in the immediate area. There's no scorching on the trees, no breakup prior to crash. The fire started on the ground. The investigators are certain Flight 821 was intact before it crashed. The first step in investigating the Aeroflot Nord 821 crash is finding out if the 737 was mechanically sound when it left Moscow. In Russia, tracking down records can be complicated by bureaucratic roadblocks. Great. We got them. Let's see what they can tell us. Good. They go back to when the plane went into service. A safety and certification company, Bureau Veritas, regularly inspected the Boeing 737 and kept detailed records going back years. When this aircraft went down, the rudder system became an object of interest. Remember the design flaw in the 737's rudder that we discovered in the 1990s? It caused multiple accidents before it was caught. In 1994, U.S. Air Flight 427 was approaching Pittsburgh when a problem known as rudder hardover caused the aircraft to nosedive and slam into woods nearby. All 132 people on board that 737 were killed. 
it was not an isolated incident. A rudder hard over was something that occurred because of a mismatch between hydraulic pressure on the rudder on the 737, which caused the rudder to move in one direction, which could not be reversed with the rudder pedals. Boeing decided to redesign the actuator of the rudder system to prevent these rudder hard overs. Have a look. Did they fix this one? But you never can be perfectly sure that the fix is in. The team now considers whether a frozen rudder caused Flight 821 to nosedive into the ground. They hunt for the maintenance records for any mention of the rudder. Wait, I've got a work order here. It's from 2005 for replacing the rudder PCU. It's a match. They took a look at the power control unit for the rudder and found that the airplane had the new system fitted, and then the investigation moved on from there. The airline insists both pilots was very experienced. Still looking for leads in the case of Aeroflot Nord Flight 821, the team shifts the focus to the pilots. And yet the controller said the crew seemed confused when he asked them to redo their approach. Captain had over 3,900 flying hours, 1,400 of this at night. That's not a ton, but it's enough. Wait, two thirds of his hours were in the cockpit of the Tupuri 134. The 2134. Built in Russia, the Tupolev 134 was one of the most widely used jets in the former Soviet bloc. It required twice as many crew members to fly them as a modern Western jet like Boeing or Airbus. The placement of the engines on the Tupolev is also different. The engines are close together at the rear of the plane. In this design, mismatched engines require minimal adjustment since the thrust is all coming from the back. A Boeing 737's engines are spaced apart, slung beneath the wings. With a mismatch in engine power, the stronger side pushes the wing up and requires the pilot's constant correction of control surfaces to maintain balance. The team delves into the training records for the captain of Flight 821. They need to know if he was properly trained to fly a 737, especially one with mismatched engines. And the Fed have got his training certification for the 737 on September 10th, 2006, but then went back to flying the Tupolev. He didn't get into the 737 again until January 9th, 2007. The investigators now know that Captain Medvedev's training on the Boeing 737 was woefully inadequate. The team realizes that First Officer Alaberton had much more flying experience than the captain. OK, tomorrow we'll try the air. Take care. What they now need to find out is if the First Officer was any better equipped to fly the 737. I am from IAC. I have a quick question for you. The investigators wonder how the first officer performed during his 737 training. He had plenty of experience on Antonov 2. An Antonov 2 is a huge propeller biplane with a single engine designed mainly for agricultural and forestry purposes. The investigators learn that one thing the first officer struggled with was flying with thrust asymmetry. Check the speed you are banking. Bank angle. Bank angle. You're banking. Bank angle. Bank this angle. is the third time. Bank angle. The investigators are surprised by the extent of the first officer's shortcomings flying the 737. Medvedev was simply too green to captain the 737. The team concluded that the airline should never have paired a new captain with such an unproven first officer. 
Chappaquoensa goalkeeper Jackson Fullman has survived the crash of Lamia Flight 2933. I woke up in the middle of the forest. I don't know how long I'd been asleep for. Besides Jackson Fullman, three other Chappaquoensa players have survived. 71 people are dead, making this one of the worst tragedies in the history of sport. The morning light reveals the full extent of the crash. The Lamia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain called Cerro Gordo. The Colombian Aircraft Accident Investigation Group wastes no time starting their work. The team is on site at daybreak, with Julian Echeverri in charge. It looks like the fuselage spun around 180 degrees. Echeverri and his team work around the clock, collecting evidence in the mountain. Landing gear was down. Look, flaps are extended. The plane was configured for landing. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. But it crashed. 10 miles short of the runway. The investigators have a tough job ahead. Aircraft debris has tumbled down both sides of the mountain. But their biggest clue is what they don't find at the scene of the crash. No scorch marks. No fuel smell either. The fuel level indicators are at zero. The plane was out of fuel. The investigators are mystified. Why would the plane have run out of fuel? Was it a fuel leak? Engines one and four are up there. Two and three are here by the main wreckage. All four engines are located and examined. There is no sign of fire or failure. They conclude the engines worked until the fuel ran out. The question is, how did the fuel get so low in the first place? Was it a mechanical failure or human error? With pressure mounting, the investigators dig into their work. They hope the flight recorders will help them understand why Lamia 2933 didn't make it to the airport. Take these black boxes to the lab. Both the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder appear to be in good shape. But they'll have to be sent to a lab to be processed before investigators can analyze them. While the flight recorders are being analyzed, investigators summon the last person to speak with the crew of Lamia 2933, air traffic controller. Thank you for meeting with me. It's been a very difficult time. Tell me what happened before they declared the emergency. Were there other planes on hold? Yes, three. Um, see, they were in a holding pattern right when Lamia radioed. What did you do when they told you they had a fuel emergency? But that's the crazy thing. They only told me that they had a fuel emergency right before they crashed, with no warning. The crew's delay in informing her put Molina in a tough situation. They, they were in a holding pattern. The investigators right need to know how she handled it. To find out, they turned to the air traffic control tapes, which recorded the final 18 minutes of communication between Molina and the crew. OK, let's start. Right, Agro 2933, good evening. Lamia 2933 control, good evening. Lamia 2933, request priority for approach. We have a fuel problem. Even after reporting a fuel problem, the crew doesn't give Molina any cause for concern. Understand you are requesting priority for landing also with a fuel problem, correct? Affirmative. How long until you need to start your approach to 93? Only when Molina checks in with them does the crew finally speak up. We have a fuel emergency. That's why I'm asking you at once for final approach, requesting immediate descent. Pause. They declare a fuel emergency. 
seven minutes after entering the holding pattern. Why wait so long? Then they turn left here towards the runway. Turning left puts flight 2933 in the direct path of other planes in the holding pattern. Keep going. Let me at 2933 make a right turn now to begin your descent. Negative. We're already starting to descend. I'm heading for the runway. Moments later, the crew reports the plane has lost power. 2933, total electrical failure without fuel. Stop. We didn't explain the situation until it was too late. There's nothing she could have done. The investigators conclude Milena did what she could to help Lamia 2933 in those stressful moments before the crash. But the recordings raise another question. Here's what I don't get. The fuel warning should have gone off long before the start of the approach. But they don't declare an emergency until here. Did the plane's fuel warning system malfunction? Or is there another reason for the crash that they'll need to explore? United Express Flight 6291. This is the first fatal accident involving the Jetstream 4100. For the safety of all the passengers using this plane, it's critical to figure out what happened. By morning, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board, including lead investigator Al Dickinson, are on the scene. OK, let's make sure we got all four corners. They first need to find out if the entire plane is at the crash site. If any major parts are missing, it could mean the aircraft was breaking apart before it hit the ground. The importance of finding all four corners of the aircraft is if something comes off an aircraft before impact, you probably can trace it back to the initial cause of why they had a problem. So it's really important to identify both wingtips, the nose, and the tail. But their challenge is immense. What's left of United Express 6291 is barely recognizable as an airplane. And the fire was very intense, and it made it hard just to try to identify the different pieces of the aircraft. You see stuff, and you wonder, what is it? We've got the nose over here. We've got the tail over here. We found all four corners of the aircraft right at the accident site. And we've got the wings out over there. So the aircraft was intact until it contacted the ground. And therefore, you can eliminate any structural thing that might have happened during flight. The plane did not start coming apart in midair. But was the pilot in control? We have a cold front running through here. What were the weather advisories telling pilots? Dickinson hopes the experience of other pilots that night can shed light on what happened to United Express 6291. Rhyme mixed icing between 2,000 and 19,000 feet. Did any other flights fly through it? If other pilots flew through the same icing conditions, they might have experienced a similar problem. Yes, two, just before 6291 was due in. OK, let's talk to them. In this case, there were planes flying in the general area, and some of them landed at the airport in Columbus. So it's important to talk to these pilots to find out what the conditions were on their descent. And it was rhyme ice? The pilot of a plane that landed one minute before Flight 6291 was due in remembers descending through freezing drizzle. What do you think you picked up? About a half inch? And it didn't give you any trouble? OK, thanks. Hey, same amount of ice, but no trouble. The pilots of other planes reported similar conditions, but had no problems landing. The fact that several airplanes landed preceding this airplane under similar weather conditions means the weather should not have precluded a safe landing at the airport. Thanks for coming in. 
So you left at 7? And when the investigators speak to United Express pilots who earlier in the day flew the same plane through similar weather. And you had to de-ice. They reported no difficulties with the plane's de-icing system. We looked at everything that was involved in the weather situation. They should have been able to fly through this moderate icing and land successfully. 